You have to start from a place of, I'm really passionate about this. You know, a lot of times before a season, when you go to sell something, you'll say, what are they looking for? Well, this mm -hmm. network is looking for family and this one wants workplace and this one wants, you know, and so you try to go, okay, well, what do I have? But you still have to come from some seed of something that makes you giggle or something that inspires you, or it's just going to be flat. It's not going to be good or original. You're listening to Screenwriters Need to Hear This with Michael Janet. Hello, everyone. It's Michael Jammon. Welcome to another episode of Screenwriters Need to Hear This. I got another fantastic guest today. I'm starting yeah, to think that my listeners don't deserve me because I have so many great people on this podcast. And my next guest is no exception. Emily bribery, Cutler. All bribery. Welcome. So let me go through your. Hello. Let me go, let me go through Thank some you. of your credits so people know who you are. Just to refresh their mem my memory okay. as well as, um, you know, the people listening. So. Emily has written for, I'm going to just blow through some of your credits. They're really pretty impressive. Zoe, uh, we, we're going to start with the start with the beginning. Uh, Zoe, Duncan, Always. Jack, and Jane. Uh, Rude Awakening. Good Girls Don't. I don't know how you got that one. Less Than Perfect. That's a pretty good, pretty good show. Love, Inc. Blue Collar TV. Carpoolers. Community. Free Agents. Suburgatory. How to Live With Your Parents, The Michael J. Fox Show, Growing Up Fisher, The Odd Couple. This is the one with Jack Klugman? No, not that one. <laughs> no. Tony it, Randall? It was. Yeah. Yes, it was. <laughs> AP bio, bio and Fresh Off the Boat. You have a lot of, do you take your jobs based on the location of, you have a lot of jobs that with locations in them. No, and oh, I thought you meant the location of where you're actually doing the writing. In that case, Oh, no, we all do yes. that. <laughs> closer to my house yeah yeah close to your house so man thank you so much emily let's just start at the beginning because you started as actually a, as an actor and you were you were a exactly. local celebrity in la that's when i first found out about you you were the host of nine line <laughs> you were started as a comic nine line, which was a a tiny ridiculous so, little show interstitial show that came on between the maury povich show and the jerry springer show i popped but, in and did a little uh Terrible comedy. But we all knew about you. And you, so you started as a stand up, right? A little bit. I was a very, I dated a lot of stand ups. So I did a tiny bit of stand up, but I spent a lot of time in the clubs watching stand ups. Yes. But then I how did, did you? Myself. So that, what was your goal then? Like when you moved out to LA, what was your goal? To be a writer, an actor, or what? Stand up? No. Acting. Acting. I was an actor. I was on a, you may have seen me as the driving instructor on Beverly Hills 90210. The first now one. I, now <laughs> I know. The first one of those. The first one. <laughs> and then what made you decide to transition to, to writing? Well, it was really one of those things where I've, I've written all my life. I've written little books and songs and movies, just constantly writing. And so I decided I'll just write in my downtime from acting. Mm -hmm. And as you know, you have an enormous amount of downtime from acting. So it, it, the writing just sort of took off and the acting was kind of, you know, it was not as fun. So I oh, kept with the writing. Because the, the acting wasn't as fun in terms of waiting to get a job, you mean? Or no, or did you, yes. you what was not fun? <laughs> Going years without a job, yes. Or, or was it just like, the, like is the, was the acting not fun or like the process of getting jobs not fun? the process of getting jobs right. the acting is great i mean it's just the the business of acting is you know not for the faint of heart and i was writing and it seemed to be taking off and i enjoyed it so much i figured why not do that and then i don't have to lose you know 30 pounds and go to auditions and horrible heat and yeah all it that kind of stuff. Ass. and then how did you so how did you transition to getting your first gig like how did that work I was doing a show, an improv show called The Dysfunctional Show at a little theater in Hollywood. And uh, some producers the, came to see show? it and asked me and one other person. Yeah, so, okay, in, so in, um, in Hollywood and, and produce, a lot of people came to see it. It was a very funny show. And they, they said, would you and one other guy who was a friend of mine in the show like to write a pilot oh, wow. for Brandon Tartikoff? Um, years and years ago, it was a, a funny pilot spoofing, um, spoofing, it, it's about a, a network news host, uh, like, uh, a Ted Bull who falls on hard times and winds up getting a job in a small town. It's the only job he can get. And so, um, and, and the lead in that actually was Matthew Perry's father, John Bennett Perry. 
Wait, so I'm sorry. So they actually produced this pilot? Um, yeah, they made wow. the pilot. It was a lot of comedians. Um, it was uh, very, um, it wasn't like a, like a, it was more, it was a comedy sketch sort of show. It wasn't a sitcom or anything like wow. that. And then from there, I wrote a movie um, for Jason Alexander, who I had met in the dysfunctional show, which didn't end up getting made, but I got an agent from that. So it was a lot of sort of acting this moments is pretty that impressive. led me into. So I, even how did you get these industry types to, sh I think so, to show up to your, to your, you know, show, your little, what was like, it was like a 99 seat the, the, theater. It was, a, it was a really tiny show, but all the people in it, it was improv. It was basically on a huge show, um, but improv. And we were making fun of talk shows. And um, so a lot of comedians who were in the clubs would just stop by because it's, you know, for an hour and play a character on a panel. And, um, you know, let's see, it was Bob Odenkirk, David Cross, Warren Hutcherson, Brian Regan. I mean, there was a, just a ton of comics who showed up to do this. Wow. And I think Jason Alexander knew someone in the show and he was he was a guest in the show. It was different every week because it was like a talk show. So different subject every week and then you'd kind of get a character and then it was just improv from there. So you just so made a really good it case. It was just good exposure. It's because people ask me all the time, Oh, and I mean this. I know it sounds like I'm saying this, but like, like, do I have to move to Hollywood to make it in Hollywood? And like, you just made a really good case for like, yeah, because this is where it is. You know, you have to put yourself out there. Or do you disagree now? And I think that as a, as a writer, no, I completely agree. I think uh -huh. you have to be, it doesn't mean if you're a film writer and you want to write a film in some other part of the country, eventually you will have to come here to have meetings or, I mean, now with Zoom, maybe it's not as difficult, but you just want to be around people. You want to meet people that can either right. help you or advise you or influence right. you in some positive way. And uh, so I would say if you're really serious about writing for TV and film, you should think about coming to LA for a while, maybe not forever, but for a while. Right. Sure. And yeah, and you know, you, so you've been here, you've been here when you, right after college, you, you moved here, right? Or did you do something before? Oh my God. I know I went to New York first. I went to New York because I was going to be a serious theater actress. Really? And then um, I quickly gave that up and, and <laughs> came to LA. Yeah. But why? What was that like? Um, well, I came to act. I was kind of like theaters ton of people in LA and I wound up getting an agent a musical agent I had to sing for them and they said come out to LA um, we need funny women um, yeah. and so I came out and then just never left and funny women are in demand I'm contemplating here. leaving do, 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 <laughs> oh, there, you... there are funny women I heard there weren't any no yes. but I'm saying they're they're in Sar demand sarcastic. I mean like if you're a funny woman you'll work you'll you know Show yourself. There your are hand. a lot of fu funny women. There are yeah. a lot of funny women who don't work. There are funny women who do work, but there are yeah. an enormous amount of funny women. Yes. Yeah. And so wait, did you, at some point, were you joking? Did you want to turn around and, and leave LA? No, I'm, I'm thinking about that now because oh. A, we have a strike coming and <laughs> B, I want to live in an enormous house with just a staff of people to wait on me hand and foot. So I figure I'll go to a small town and just we're buy a small town and. Where would you go? I know you're. I know you're. I know you're being facetious, but where? Do I don't know. I, That's why I never go anywhere. I, you don't. I do. I think you know. After my kids go to college, where could I settle down that wouldn't be as you know wouldn't be a big city, and I'd have my neighbors and I would be close friends, and we'd all get together and barbecue and walk down to a beach, and there'd be no crime and all of this. And then I realized there isn't that place, or if there is, I don't know what it is. So that, so you're not going any further so, than that. You're not really. I'm just too lazy because then I'd have to move. I'd have to call people. I'm, I'm trying to figure no, out. I, I I I I don't need, I don't think I'm leaving my house. Uh, no, I'm not okay. serious. I I uh, I could leave. Uh -huh. But um, it would require um, paperwork and phone calls and faxing and, you know, does your husband, and does your husband feel talking the same to way? others. And I just can't do any of that. Does your husband feel the same way? My husband was born and raised. He will never, never leave. He'll never leave. leave forever. Right. So he loves it here. Okay. Now, but you're an Angelino now, you're saying. I, I'm seriously doubting it. Now, I want to know... Um, I guess of all your credits, maybe the maybe the highest. We've had some high profile shows, but maybe the most beloved one is Community. What do you think? Is that the one people want to know? Probably. About? 
Tell People are obsessed with that show and they're still obsessed much. I mean, I know it's airing now. It was on Netflix for a while. Um, I wonder if it's still on Netflix. I, um, and it's on the planes. It's on people yeah. are, are very, uh, we have great fans for community. Yeah. And what was great, it like working on that show? Cause it seems really hard. So it's a hard show to write for. It seems. It was a wonderful and nightmarish pool of madness and joy. It was um, the best of times and the worst of times. Well, the show creatively was absolutely wonderful. There was yeah. a lot of freedom. The characters were great. The actors were great. Um, the writers were great. Uh, Dan Harmon, who was running the show, was incredibly brilliant and interesting yeah. and strange. Um, the hours <clears throat> were insane. And I had two young, young children at the time, and I was often there overnight. You know, I had my toothbrush and blankets in an office. So yeah. that wasn't ideal um, if you're a parent or if you have a, a life outside of the show. But why was it? What what was the, was he taught? Was someone tossing out scripts? Were they? What was? Why was it so late? Um, have you been on? Have you not been on a show where you've had hours like that? You know, not you were not class. really. Like, just shoot me. We would work. We had a couple nights where we worked till four in the morning, but that's only because like there was a, something blew up. There was a script was th th you know thrown right, out. Right, of course, of course. But it wasn't a regular. And it's thing. normal to stay late sometimes. Um, this was. I think that not all artists are good at running a show, are good uh -huh. at time management and managing. Oh. I think that's a different skill set. And yeah. Dan Harmon was really brilliant at uh, writing and creating and everything except time management and not overthinking things and yeah. um, really understanding to respect other people's time. I think he would yes. say that as well. See, that's um, the thing. You People are kind don't... of in his mind. You're in the showrunner's mind when you're on a show. And if it's really messy in there and disorganized, yeah. the show will be too. People don't realize that, is that no one becomes a, a comedy writer because they want to go into management. They become com comedy writers so they don't have to go into yes. management. Then they get a yes. job where they're running, they're managing people. And it's a different skill set. And yes. And a lot of people, I have talked to writers when I say, do you want your own show? They say, I want to write my own show and I want to see it happen. But the thought of having to do that massive amount of work mm -hmm. in meetings and executives and storyboards, it's just, it can be really overwhelming. It's not the writing part that you signed up for. It's a whole different thing. Uh, even the so, writing part is, a, I, people say, I want to be a showrunner. You're saying that only because you don't know what a showrunner does. Right. You know, yeah. It's um, it's funny. I had Stephen Engel on a while ago. He kind of said the same thing. He was like, you know, it's your it's job thankless. becomes a show. <laughs> It's and yes. yeah, yeah. I we were same thing when we were running shows uh, before we started running shows. It's like I could do this, and then you do it. Like, oh my god, what did I sign up for? And why do I want to do this? The fun yeah, part well, is being in the writer's room and creating things, and I don't want to be, you know, yeah. figuring out what type of ice cube you're going to use in this scene. I mean, there's, you know, some people love that, but it is a different. I wouldn't say that writers necessarily naturally have that skill set. Yeah, and and so okay, so that's a good enough reason to be. That's bad for morale too. Yeah, especially when you got two kids, you want to be home. You don't want to live there. Yeah. But also, if it's a show I created, I'm much more likely to want to get into the minutia of things and do that job. I I never understand when a showrunner takes over a show that they didn't create. Mm -hmm. Maybe they don't even love the show, but they take the job and just do such a massive amount of work for something that's not really. Yeah giving them the joy or satisfaction of their own creation. And then what then was like maybe your favorite show that you just loved every second of being on? And often yeah. it's not the most, often it's not the show that people even heard of. No, I, <laughs> I had a phenomenal time writing for Blue Collar TV, which was a sketch comedy show mm -hmm. for Jeff Foxworthy and Bill Engvall and Larry the Cable Guy, right. uh, all whose politics I do not agree with. However, um, writing for it, it was just hilarious. I mean, it's wonderful if you if you enjoy writing sketches. Greatest group of people. We were all starting out and never done anything before. And um, we, we got to go down to Atlanta and produce it and see what people responded to and what they didn't, different kinds of comedy. And it was just fun and silly. It was silly. We got to be silly, you know, all day.
But then tell me about writing your sketches because you need a whole separate packet. You need to make, yes. it's a whole different skill set. Like it's completely different, but I came up doing that as an actor uh, um, with friends. We did a lot of sketch comedy and we wrote for sketch comedy groups. So that was in my wheelhouse. And also it's not as, it's not as daunting. It's not 30 pages. It's not right. 50 pages. It's like, Hey, I just have to write three funny pages that have a beginning, middle and an end. I can do that. You but know, it's all when premise. You have to come up with a premise that's funny on its own. The the one liner yeah. has to be, and and then you have to establish these characters in thirty, not even yes. whatever, fifteen seconds, and then go. You know, and also I'm kind of picky. Like I don't like sketches that just ramble. Like when you have a funny character that has some kind of catchphrase, uh -huh. uh, it's not enough of a sketch for me to just have that funny character say that catchphrase over and over and everyone laugh. Like I really do believe in building a little story and having it end in a satisfying way. So that that is challenging. Do you do any sketch writing still? Oh God, I haven't done it in years. No? I haven't done it in years. So now. what is, is it, are you mainly, yeah, narrative sitcoms? Are you, are you doing dramas as well? What are you doing? No, mostly sitcoms, a lot of um, single camera half hours. Mm -hmm. um, do you prefer and, that for any reason? Single I, always to prefer, I, I always prefer the one I'm not doing. Yes. <laughs> Whichever one I'm doing, I say, well, it's just because I'm doing this kind. I should go back to multicams because I love them. And then I work on a multicam and go, why am I doing this? I should be writing a single cam. Yeah, yeah I think it's so funny. I, I feel the same exact way. And I think we all do. I think it's like, eh, you know, whenever, same thing with animation. I'd rather do live action. Whatever you're not doing is what you. <laughs> I've never done animation, though. Uh -huh. I'm almost scared of it because it's so, you can do so much. There's no, not as much structure. You can kind of just think outside the box, which I think is yeah. wonderful, but I'm also terrified. Uh, take comfort knowing that it's not Writer's Guild. So <laughs> it's never covered by the Writer's Guild. <laughs> so you'll make so, less money. So, so Simpsons and Family well, Simpsons, Guy, those shows must be. Well, Simpsons and King of the Hill are, but the King of the Hill didn't start as a uh, Writer's Guild. But now, whenever you sign, we've sold a bunch of animated shows, it's and uh, it's never right. They, it's like it's a deal breaker. Nope, it's IATSE. and so that's so crazy because it's so much writing and so much work, mm -hmm. and so much thought goes. It into seems it. illegal to me because they can the studios get to choose which guild, which you can be covered by IATSE or Writers Guild. And you always choose Writers Guild, but they say IATSE because they can pay you less. It's like, well, how is that legal? I don't understand. That doesn't how that's seem legal. fair. Yeah. You know what we should do, Michael? We should go on strike. When? How about May 1st? What, <laughs> when you, are you, I guess you're doing a lot of development now. Is that what your, is that what your focus is on? What are you, yes. what are you up to? Yeah. I'm doing a, um some pilots. I have a pilot that I wrote with another person that's floating around. I have a pilot I just finished that's floating around. I have a pilot I'm supposed to do for Fox that I haven't even pitched yet, and we're supposed to go on strike soon. So really, who knows if that but when will... you say floating around, you mean you've written the script first and you're trying to sell yes. it, or what? Yes. Yeah. And you like you like yes. doing that because usually we don't uh, do the that. Two that are floating around. Then I have some that I'm supervising. Um, no, I don't like doing that. It depends on um, if I have a, an idea that I feel I need to execute for someone to really get what it is, then uh -huh. I'll write it myself. But I'd much rather, uh, gee, I don't know, be paid to yeah. write it. So write um, to pitch it. And yes. then you're supervising, because even supervising, I'm not crazy about doing, but you're it doing depends. It. I only supervise if it's a project that comes to me that I really, really love and can't say no to. Other uh -huh. than that, I don't, I get offered a lot of jobs of, will you supervise this show about a young, you know, Chinese woman who has a dumpling factory and whatever crazy thing I get, unless uh -huh. it's something that I go, that's hilarious. I want to be a part of it. I just don't do it. And who, how are these coming to you through your agent? Random ways, yeah, they kind of float to me through my agent or or a writer will call me and say, I'm working on something, would you be willing to supervise, you know, stuff uh, like that. Like a writer that you've, a young writer you've worked with in the past, you mean? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Interesting, interesting, yeah. Because, um, yeah, that's the thing, Go taking an idea out, rather take the idea out than, than yeah, it's hard, it's hard out there. It is hard, and the thing is, and I, it's it's hard for writers who are, you know, a, a lot are very um, introverted, is you have to sell something in a room to people, mm -hmm. which means you have to kind of come out of your shell a little bit and do a performance, a sale. And again, that's another skill set that a lot of as, writers have to learn, you know? 
but I imagine as an actor, that part probably comes easy to you. That is easy to me, and it's fun. I, I uh -huh. like doing it. I don't mind doing it, even when you get a very bad audience of people just not laughing and staring at you as if you've offended them and they hate you. Uh -huh. um, but I don't mind doing that, but there are a lot of writers who just, it's terrifying, and they don't like it, and it's a whole new skill they have to learn, you know? Yeah. And be, be warned before you move out to L.A. that if you want to sell ideas to people, you will become a, a bit of a salesman and have to do a sales pitch. Mm -hmm. Now, I'm skipping around here a little bit because I have a lot of questions when I ask you, but when you when you did The Odd Couple, you were briefing... Is that the right word? A, a show that's been on, there's been multiple variations of that show. Yes. And so what was that like? You know, actually you worked with, uh, yeah, what was Gary that Marshall. Like with, with Gary Marshall? He was in the room a lot or a little? He came to every taping. He came to the room for a while. And then, I mean, he would just show up whenever he felt like it, but I think he came to every taping. Um, he was wonderful and it was fascinating to sit with him and, and hear about his experiences because he's well, so he would sit in Hollywood. Into the he was oh, in the yeah. writer's room? Yeah. And every he... time I saw him, I would give him a kiss uh, on the he... cheek. But I gave him a kiss every time. I felt it was something I had to do. I mean, we grew up with all those shows. I mean, yes. I mean, was that, I mean, that's such an honor. But did he give notes or was he just like, ah, holding court? A little bit of giving. No, he took it seriously. He wasn't uh, there just for the hell of it. He, he took it seriously and he listened to all the jokes and he commented on things. Um, but he didn't... Uh, he didn't get in the way of anything. He wasn't uh -huh. in the writer's room that much. Um, but he would send in jokes sometimes for scripts that he'd read. He'd send in his Oh, really? Pictures. Yeah. What's, what kind of story, do you remember, like what kind of stories, what was it like when he was in the room? Um, his stories were a little more broad. They were of a different time. Sometimes it would be like, a monkey gets loose in the apartment and both <laughs> guys have to go and find him. who's going to take the monkey. And you're like, well, maybe... Not that. But how do you say no to him? <laughs> how do you say no to Gary Marshall? When I don't think you do. I think you just say, that's interesting. Yeah, we were thinking about this. And he was very collaborative. Uh -huh. I mean, he didn't, it, there was no ego there that I saw. He was just happy to be there and be around writers and have the odd couple coming alive yet again. But, but I actually, what I really meant was like, did he, I mean, he must have told stories from his past, like, you know, working with, uh, I don't know, the Fonz or whatever. Yes, <laughs> yes. And he also gave... This was a lesson I took from him that I will never forget. He said, don't um, make your work your life. Have a life uh -huh. and work and don't just work. Don't did, you just... Read, did you read his book, Wake Me When It's Funny? I no, I never did. I never oh, did. I remember reading that just before I was breaking into the business. And it was just so, it was like, ah, oh, I want to work in that business. Like, it makes you want to work in Hollywood. So, so it's like lovely. But he yes. tells a story. I think it was on the the odd couple. They couldn't make a scene funny. Like he was like, it's missing something. So like they give like I think the solution. I'm getting. I'm sure I'm getting this the character wrong. But it was like they they gave Felix a big spoon or something. Yeah, like, yeah. give him a big yes. spoon, and then yes. it was funny. And, and also, um, well, yes, I think he told that story in the room too. <laughs> give someone a prop, and right. often I think we did maybe give Matthew Perry a prop here and there to uh -huh. give him something to do. <laughs> did you guys watch? I mean, we all saw The Odd Couple, but did you go back through old episodes and go, you know what, we can, we can do this again? I'd seen a lot of them. I'd seen a lot of them. I mean, the premise is really about the two guys, about yeah. two mis mismatched roommates and how they get along in the world. So yeah. you can do that a variety of different ways. I was surprised, you know, when Matthew Perry wanted to play Oscar because I had sort of seen him in a Felixy way, Yeah, but he maybe wanted to play Oscar. Maybe that's why. And so what was it like working with him? off of Friends when he was at the biggest star in the in the world? No, he wasn't right off of Friends. Many, many years had gone by. Oh, was it? Um, it was a learning experience. Oh. Um, it, it, you know, uh, I've also worked with Chevy Chase. Yes. And these <laughs> are guys... Of difficult to have actors. Won't run the subject. These are guys who have super, super talented, amazing comic timing, Mm -hmm. but maybe have not taken the best care of themselves so they're not able to do what they once were able to do. So that uh -huh. is always sad when you see that happen. And right. it was just challenging to work with Matthew because he was not in the best, um, at yeah. his best, he, I at mean, his he, best. He would probably, he's probably come out and said that a million times over since then. He said that in his book. He apologized yeah. to the odd couple writers in his book. Oh, did he? He did, yeah. Wow. Because it was kind of, it was a little bit weekend at Bernie's. 
Yeah. Um, so. Oh wow. <laughs> keeping him him going. And um, he was an executive producer on the show. He was. Yes. A lot of people don't understand, and that, and I and I think you can count me as one of them. Uh, like what more control when an actor is an executive producer they have more control but to be honest they have the same amount of control even when they're not you can't force them to say something right so you you explain it to me i I'll also listen. don't when it when an actor is an executive producer it means they can see the cuts and right. they can say cut cut this joke or put this in and right. again i don't know that that their strongest skill set right. they're so i never think it's super helpful there are some that are very smart and that mm. Um, but I generally would leave that to the people who know more about that and leave the acting to the actors. Yeah. Generally would be my preference. Have you done, have you directed or have you, do you aspire to direct at all? Not at all. It's the strangest thing because I think I'm a bossy person uh -huh. um, and I do when I'm on set know exactly what I want, but I'm not, um, I don't think I'm visual enough to know exactly what a shot should look like and then this part. I just like the acting. I like working with yes. the actors. That's right. what I like to do. So um, camera do, stuff is not my. So you do that a lot? Are you often the writer on set? Yes, I enjoy being the writer on set. I feel like I can speak the language of an actor. So yes. it's, and it's fun. Um, and uh, there's just a great sense of camaraderie and it's nice to get out of the writer's room and be on a set. Um, but are you doing I that for that. shows that uh, that are you doing for shows that even that you don't write? You know, you're not the the writer of that show. Or are you usually the no. assigned? No, no, I have been assigned to set, and I have mentored younger writers who've never been on a set before, mm -hmm. um, which is a really good thing to do because you don't want to throw a younger writer on a set when they have no idea what they're doing. No. But you also want to make sure that that younger writer is on a set so that they are learning and can move up the ladder, really knowing what they're doing. And that brings us to the writer's strike because that's not really happening. Is it, from where I'm sitting, it's not really happening anymore because these young writers, uh, for the most, well, I don't know, I've done a network show in so long, but on, on these cable, these low budget shows that I'm on, often you're just working on pre-production and then you're, yes. you're done. And so the writers aren't coming to set at all. There's, you know, no one's And what's happening set. is writers are moving up. Um, in my day, you had to be a staff writer for a very long time before mm -hmm. you got bumped up. I don't know if people know, but on a staff, there are different levels um, and each level has different um, job requirements. And what's happening is a staff writer will come in and write for a season and then move up so quickly, maybe mm -hmm. bump up a few levels to a producer. And then they're put on a set without having any idea what to do or what each person on the set does or what their role is. Yeah. Um, and it's really important to teach people at the early stages every aspect of a television show and no that is not happening very often hey it's michael jammin if you like my videos and you want me to email them to you for free join my watch list every friday i send out my top three videos these are for writers actors creative types you can unsubscribe whenever you want i'm not going to spam you and it's absolutely free just go to michaeljammin.com watch list I see that as being really bad. Maybe you'll feel, I wonder how you feel. For, for like, I don't know if there'll be multi-camera shows in the future because you there's so much learning that you have to do. And like, who, who's gonna be, there's no, you know, who? how are they learning this? There are no multi-camera shows anymore. Where, where's the, the pool of talent, you know? Yeah, I, I don't, I mean, I do a lot of mentoring through the guild. You might do that too, where oh, you no. work with, writers it's a good thing to do you should do it yeah um you mentor younger writers who are new in the guild maybe they've had their first job but that's about it and you they can ask you questions like when i started i didn't have anybody really to ask what does this mean should what what does this person do on set where am i supposed to be what you know what is the blow to a scene i didn't know any of that stuff yeah so i, I kind of help them and give them a safe place to ask these questions which is a, a, it's great. It reminds me of all this stuff. Yeah. And, um, and I get to be around fresh young hopefuls. Um, so it's, it's a great thing to do. Um, you know, you know, I remember one of the first times on set, you know, you, they give you a big director chair to sit and your name's in it. And then I remember like dragging it to the next shot 
and I got such dirty looks. Yes. Like you don't touch that chair. That's a union yes. job. <laughs> yes. Like that's all an you do mistake. is you feel like I don't belong here. What am I doing? I don't understand anything. You just nod a lot and hope yeah. that no one will ask anything of you. But yeah. it's much kinder to send people to set feeling prepared and feeling like they have something to contribute instead of them just being terrified the entire time. So you may have already answered this question then, like, how do you see the, how has the industry changed from your point of view since you've been in it? Um, well, it's changed a lot in, I mean, we're striking for certain reasons. Um, rooms are getting much smaller. Mm -hmm. um, it seems like there's more product out there, but for some reason, um, jobs are hard to get mm -hmm. and there are sort of mandates on shows and there are mm -hmm. fewer writers. And there's shorter production time. Um, writers move up faster. That is something that happens. You don't have to be a staff writer for a long time before you move up the ladder. And I but think I don't think that's a good thing, to be honest. I don't think that's a good thing. Okay. I, I don't. I don't know that you. Ha I don't believe in staff writers not getting paid for a script. I think right. that's silly because they are writing and creating a product. They should be paid for it. Mm -hmm. But I do think that before you're bumped up another level, you should really have a lot of experience and know what's going to be required at that second level and be able to deliver that. Um, I actually think that that writers, I believe that was the guild's idea to protect young writers. And I think it failed actually. Like, I think it was the intention was if you don't have to pay them, that way, that way they get to write a script and they learn, you know what I'm saying? Yeah, and so but that they was, are still writing it. And some staff writers are just fantastic <laughs> and write a perfectly terrific script and don't get paid for it. And I always found that yeah. odd. Yeah. I think that was like one of those things that backfired well-meaning. Uh, I could be wrong about that, but anyway. But so, yeah, that's how it's that's how it's changed. What about selling shows? Do you think how has that changed for you? Well, now they have and I've never used one um, pitch decks where you're doing a whole visual presentation with your pitch. And I don't I, I don't feel that's necessary, but um, a lot of studios like that. Mm. It gives them an image in in their mind of what you're going for. Um, that's not... I always felt that was more for drama than spend comedy. I, I think nowadays people will do it. They'll do it for comedy. They'll do it for drama. They'll, mm -hmm. you know, show pictures of actors that they think would be good in the roles. And I don't find it necessary, but. And certainly works. working with pods is probably a bigger thing now it, do you, you, than it was like what well, there was a time you, you as a writer you could just sell a tv show you didn't have to yes. have all these people attached to it to sell a show yes and a lot of times when you do that you you get a lot of cooks in the kitchen mm -hmm. so the work that you start out with just starts to morph into something completely different than when you started and i like you know for better or worse i like a clear vision to a show mm -hmm. where you know and i'm sure you've been working a lot in streaming and stuff like that where it's someone's voice like a mark Marin or something and it actually comes through onto the screen you don't have to like it maybe it's terrible but it's a clear right. perspective and what happens when you have so many cooks in the kitchen is the perspective starts to get watered down that's one thing that dan Harmon simply didn't allow on community um he was very ballsy and was just like this is what we're going to do and the studio would say no no you can't do that and he would be like yeah okay this is what we're going to do so like it or hate it it made it onto the screen as a singular vision of what that show should be. And it shows, but that's that so shows. ballsy because there's two things. I think you kind of have to be kind of like a genius level to pull that off. Which yes, I think which, he, people, which he is. He was. But also you have to have this no fucks given. Like, I, I, I don't know many writers who would do that. You have to be a little crazy. And yeah. he's a lot crazy. So it worked out well for him. He was also kind of you know, felt like he was smarter than everyone in the room and probably was, right. which there are, there are many who think that who aren't. Um, and he just would talk them in circles and finally they just couldn't take talking anymore. So they let him do his thing. Then they fired him right. and they brought him back, which was absolutely insane. I've rarely heard of that happening. Yeah. Um, and, and he just really held firm because he knew what the show was and said, this is what we want to do. And if you don't want to do it, let's just not do it. But this is how it's going to go. And he just doubled down and did it. Where did he, what was, you, you must know, what was his first job in the business that he, where did he learn from? He did a streaming, I think he had a channel. I can't remember what it what it's oh. called. People will know like channel 24 or channel something that did a lot of, um, a lot of uh, 
internet stuff. Um, and then I think his first job was on the Sarah Silverman show uh, back when she, I think it was Comedy Central. I could be yeah, wrong about all of that. Dan Sterling did that. And they had, they did not get along. I don't think they were the really? right fit. Oh my God. And then I, he, I don't know. I think he went, actually went to community college and that community was based on his experience. Because I, I think that showrunners kind of, they, they learn how they're going to do this kind of, they, from the first job they take. Their first showrunner is the kind of the person they emulate, you know? And mm -hmm. that's kind of the school you come out of. And if your first boss was organized, you'll be organized and, you know. Not but, for me. My first real boss on a sitcom was absolutely out of his mind and an, it just just a, a, a monster human who did everything. I just sat there going, this can't be right. This can't be Hollywood. All writers cannot be doing what we were doing, which is sitting on the floor and being screamed at about paint colors for his bathroom. And he was just insane. So I was like, this can't, if this is how everything is run in Hollywood. It was yeah. on a show called Movie Stars which yeah, was uh, ha Harry Hamlin's comedic opus. Um, <laughs> and, and wait, do you want to say who the, who the writer is? Yes, I do. His Good. name was w Wayne Lemon, which already sounds kind of like a serial killer name. It's like a great character name, Wayne Lemon. And he, I think he was the son of a Baptist preacher and had no sense of humor and told us that on the first day. He's like, I'm not funny. That's not what I do. I'm not funny. I was like, well, it's great that you're running a comedy then. Oh um, my God. And we, there were only two writers. He he didn't want a staff. He wanted two baby writers. We and another writer named Bix Gayhill. We had never done it before, and so we sat on the floor and we listened to him fight with his wife. He was really abusive. It was it was a hilariously weird experience. But I remember thinking, this can't be how every show in Hollywood is run. So I did not learn how to run a show from him. I learned very much what I don't want to do, which you can also learn from your showrunner. But I would have, I'm not joking, I probably would have thought, this must be Hollywood. Like, I, I, I probably would have felt differently from you. Like, that might have scared me from ever working in Hollywood, continuing. Well, you know. I was terrified to say anything or ask anyone because you're always afraid when you start out that you're going to be either discovered as a phony and fired yeah. or you're, you just don't make waves. You don't stand up for yourself at all because you're like, if I say anything, that will never work again. So we just sucked it up. But it wasn't until later when I got on a normal staff where people were saying <clears throat> that I went, oh, OK, <laughs> that was not a normal experience. At what point, and I really mean this, like at what point in your career did you finally feel like, all right, I know how to do this job? Because it's not on day one. It's not God, on I'm not, show I'm one. Not sure I, I'm not sure I feel that way now. Um, it, uh, it, it depends. There are shows that I go in and I feel like I got this. I know exactly what I'm doing. I'm fantastic. And then uh -huh. on the very next show, I feel the complete opposite. Why am I doing this? There's no point. I have no talent. I should give up. I think... All creative people maybe ride that roller coaster a little bit of feeling like I've got something to offer. I have nothing to offer. I mean, really? I, I bounce back. It depends on the show. And it depends on if I really think I can capture the voice of something and do it justice. Like if I went to write on Succession tomorrow, I'd probably be a little nervous. I'd be excited to do it, but I might go, God, I hope I live up to this thing or I hope I can get into the voices of these characters. And then there are some that it's just natural. But even in terms of like knowing how to break a story you know, or when you go off on script and you look at that blank page, like, or you're turning and you're writing your outline, like there, there must've been a moment where you're like, okay, I think I know how to do this. Right. I mean, cause like in the, honestly, it took me, it took years and years for me to have that. Okay. I think I know how to do this. <laughs> yes. I, I think it took years and years. And I think I knew certain things. Well, I can craft a joke, but I don't know. Can I, Am I really good at story? It, you know, in meetings, people always ask and people ask your agents, are you good at story right. or are you good at jokes? And you seem to have to be in one camp or the other. Right. I think is absolutely stupid. But um, uh, I go back and forth. I mean, I still look at a blank page and, and feel a sense of, you know, excitement and fear at the same time. And am I going to do this? Am I going to blow this? And I do a little of both. Right. I've written some scripts and I'm like, wow, this really, I crapped the bed on this one. And right. some that I'm like, all right, this is pretty good. Do you um, do any writing that is not for, for sale, like just for yourself or a book or something on the side or anything? 
I draw a lot, so I uh -huh. do that on the side. Um, I used to write songs. I've written some poems. Uh -huh. um, I kind of think of what else I've written. You know, I have a friend who does game shows, and uh -huh. I, I help him with game shows a lot because that's super fun. And I have no, it's not my job, so I don't have to panic and worry about it. Right. That's a whole other, uh, that's a whole other, you know, crazy world. But that's because, really fun to do. Because the minute you put, the minute you're doing it as your profession, things change, you know? Absolutely. Like, right. Well, what's your take on that? Well, I mean, that's why I write some pilots myself that I'm not going to sell is because I come up with an idea that brings me some level of joy or that I feel I have a handle on and have uh -huh. that feeling like you're talking about, I can do this. Well, if I can really do this, I should sit down and do it. And, you know, it, it turns out well or it doesn't, but um, I do that for myself. Yes, do I hope I'll sell it? Sure, why Why wouldn't I? But I just get it out of myself. Right. A, an idea in my head, just get it on paper if you can. Just to remind yourself why you like writing. Yes. Right. Have you saw, I don't, I'm trying to remember, we've, we've written a handful of pilots on spec. I don't think we've sold any. I think the ones we've sold are always on pitches. Are you able to sell specs? Or are they just writing samples? I, no, it's always, it's always been really pitches. I can't think of a script I've sold. I've sold a movie, but never a, never on spec. A, on spec. Yeah. Sold a movie. How'd that go? What was that? Um, it was called Suddenly Yours. It was a test to see if I could write a romantic, a cheesy romantic comedy back when they made them, like those great kind of formulaic mm -hmm. romantic comedies that you see, you know, two of a year. Um, and it got bought and then just nothing happened to it. It died because then Jennifer Lopez had a movie called Made in Manhattan that was basically the same thing. And so, so that funny. got made. And so because yeah. we did, we sold the movie on spec though, it was called Only Child. And then that got killed because they had a movie in development called Middle Child. <laughs> and there I don't know if they had That's anything all in common. Changed. Of course <laughs> other not. Other than the there... word child. <laughs> yes, my God, it's a, another movie with child in the title. We must only have one. But yeah, you must it's... have had to do some rewrites. Huh? But after you sold it, they probably wanted rewrites from you now. Yes, and I got rewritten by another writer too, who changed uh -huh. it into something totally different. It was, it was like a fascinating thing to see. It became this different, creature this completely different entity with like little bits of my script in it but because sometimes i hear more often that people are like i want to i want to write movies so i'm like what you should write TV. movies like yeah what, what yeah TV, I mean, tv is movies now there are right. no more movies for the most part it's you know big blockbuster superhero movies there are a few little ones and a few ones like you know maybe a matt damon movie that will squeeze in but really television's where it where it's at Right. With streaming and everything. Did you, but did you even, did you even enjoy the process of writing movies? I did. I, you did. I did. I did. But I was, I was younger and didn't know anything. It's great mm -hmm. when you don't know anything and when you don't know what, how the business is structured and you just come from a creative place and put something on paper that brings you joy. That's right. great. And as soon as you start getting paid for it and other people get involved, you can still have joy, but it's a different kind. It's it's not pure, you know. It's well. The reason why I see because like when you when you get a note on a TV script, all right, even if it's a giant rewrite, it's still it's it's thirty minutes of television or whatever, twenty two minutes of television. If yeah. you could do a note on a on a movie and maybe it's a free rewrite that you have to do, you're a talking about ninety minute. Movie. It's a, like that. That's a lot of work. Yes, like and a, a string will a string will get pulled that seems like nothing to the person giving the note, but that to you completely unravels the entire everything. Thing. Right? Yes. I was like, I yes. don't know why. I don't know. I don't know why people want to write movies so badly. I think it might yes. be just an ego thing. Yes, there are a lot of pages to a movie, so it is daunting. Um, but again, if you have an idea inside of you and you can see where it's going and it just sort of mm. comes out of you, it doesn't feel like work. It just feels great. No, obviously you mentor people, writers, in the writers, young writers in the guild. So that means they've already sold something. They've already something. cleared a, a hurdle. Yeah, some of them are doing much better than I am. Oh, they're, really? They're they're skyrocketing. Doing... I'm like, I hope you give me a job. Wow. Yeah. Uh, but so what advice do you have for people who haven't even done gotten into the guild yet? Just keep, keep writing and keep, have an original voice and put stuff on paper. And where you are know? you getting, where are you looking for your ideas? Where are you getting your ideas from? 
I try and get my ideas from my life or, a, a, you know, a great way to get ideas. If you have a, a funny group of friends or a group of friends you hang out with and you're just sitting and shooting the shit with them and making uh -huh. each other laugh, a lot of ideas, great ideas come out of that. A lot of ideas come out of my marriage. I get a lot of ideas from my marriage, from my kids. I never wrote family shows. I was never interested in that kind of stuff. And now that I have a family, that sort of inspires me. So look to your life, look to your extended family, look to your friends. Um, I have a friend, my current pilot is about an open marriage because I have friends who are having an open marriage and I think it's just so hilarious and, and mortifying and ridiculous. And so I I wrote a pilot about it. But you know, but selling it, they always want to hear, like, how are you the only writer who can write this? And so I see, that's why I understand you stealing from your family, but from your friends with the open marriage, even though it'd be fun, are you, I mean, are you, are you prepared to answer that question? How are you going to yes, answer that? Yes, I am. How? Well, I think you do have to personalize it because I think them having the open marriage caused my husband and I to uh -huh. have a discussion about, could we ever, what would it look like? We're this just, you know, middle-aged suburban couple. Like, what is that going to look like? So that pilot became about this really unlikely like couple to do this kind of thing and what transpires because they choose to do it. So it would kind of be like my husband and I made this decision to do this thing. Here's what happened and how it went wrong. Right. So that's interesting because you're prepared. So that's you're smart because you knew going to a meeting, that's the question they're going to ask, ask you. And so, yes. yeah, you they want something from your personal experience. And the truth is you can make it from your personal experience. However you like you can, it doesn't have to be, this is exactly my experience. I lived it. It can be, this is how watching somebody else experience else's experience affected me and made me think of this. And I, you can kind of weave your own tale. Um, but are you, are you going into, when you come up with your ideas to pitch, are you, is your target to sell it? Are you always thinking like, well, what are they buying? What, what's my version? Or are you just like, this is what I got in the tank. I used to be. That's why I wrote that romantic comedy. I wanted to see if I can just, you know, churn out a pile of crap for someone who says we want a pile of crap. And, right. and I could, but nothing great comes out of that. And right. I, I do do that because I panic about money and go, I have to sell this. And they want to show about a, a flying dog. So I'll stick a flying dog in there. You do sometimes compromise, but nothing great is ever going to come out of that. You right. have to start from a place of I'm really passionate about this. You know, a lot of times before a season, when you go to sell something, you'll say, what are they looking for? Well, this mm -hmm. network is looking for family and this one wants workplace and this one wants, you know, and so you try to go, okay, well, what do I have? But you still have to come from some seed of something that makes you giggle or something that inspires you, or it's just going to be flat. It's not going to be good or original, I think. And, and how much, when you're not on staff of a show, how, what is your, what does your writing schedule look like? Oh, you said writing schedule. Um, yeah. That that implies that I'm an organized, so, um, or so you don't have one. healthy okay. human. No, I'm the worst. I'm supposed to be writing. Um, you'll always know when I'm supposed to be writing. My house will be clean. I'll yeah. be cook cooking something. Maybe yeah. I learn to bake bread. You know, I buy a new mascara and I put it like I just procrastinate yeah. forever. I'm the least organized writer. Again, that is another skill set. Like my friends who went to really tough colleges who are writers learned how to study. And in learning how to study, they also know how to write and budget their time. I think you're one of them. Didn't you go to some, didn't you I go went to, to some fancy, or some, yeah, you went, went to a fancy, fancy school. Okay. Yeah. Well, I assume if you go to a fancy school like that or, or grow up learning those skills from your parents or something, you know how to manage time. I'm the worst at it. So don't be me. Me right. Learn how to give yourself a schedule. Be the kind of person who does that. You know, I guess it's like going to the gym. I'm also the person who's like, what's your schedule for working out? Well, sometimes I go for a walk. Sometimes I sit on my ass. I just don't. I'm not as disciplined as I should be. Well, it's. I mean, it's easier for me. I have a writing partner. So it's like we agree, you know, all right, we're, we're agreeing to meet today at 10 o'clock. But so and, you, and one pushes the other and goes, come on, we got to. Yeah, yeah. No, that would be great. I need to yeah. get I need to get me one of those. Well, have you written, but you've written projects with people. You have one right I now. I have. I've written, yes. And the one that I wrote, um, the right now one, she was great. She was super disciplined and would let me kind of, you know, I could just be funny and amusing and she'd be the workhorse. But uh -huh. then I had a partner. Um, we wrote some movies together where 
he was more dysfunctional than I was. Uh -huh. So we just, I'd say, let's not work. Let's go to Starbucks and get lattes instead. And he'd go, great. <laughs> instead <laughs> of saying, no, we need to work. We need to, yeah, we were, we were not a good influence. And do you have a, what's your spot? Do you have a spot that you like to work in or are you wherever? You take your laptop wherever? Um, it's much better. It's great when I'm staffed on a show. When I'm staffed yeah. on a show and I'm in the mindset, I like to work in my office there, even if it's on something else, because it just gets me in the mindset. Um, my house, uh, where I have two children who are now teenagers, is like a war zone. It's really hard. I have an open house. There's, It's almost lofty in a way, so there's nowhere to go to hide oh. or, or to work. So I really try and go out or I wait till they're at school and you know sneak in a room somewhere but it's it's again it's not it's not orderly i'm not in one place i'm moving around and interesting yes well, discipline 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 people. get some discipline then let me ask you one final question i don't know if, i don't know if you can have an answer to this but like what gets you out of bed then what what is it makes you excited to for your i don't know to write career or in life well I said, um, let's do both let's do both um what gets me out of my bed is my children mm -hmm. because they need to be taken places. Um, <laughs> and, You're the um, Uber driver. What makes me excited to write again is, and I mean, this might just be me because I know a lot of writers like to sit alone in a cabin and write a book. To me, that's deathly. Um, yeah. For comedy, it's to be around people. Like even just talking to you now, it will spark something and or make me feel like you know it's why people go to the gym because you're surrounded by other people doing the thing that you're supposed to be doing and mm -hmm. it helps you so when i'm not on a staff which is a very collaborative thing where you're in a room with a lot of funny people and i'm on my own it's not as much fun it's much harder to get out of bed and motivate so talking to you is helpful my husband's really funny so i'll run ideas around with him i'll call friends for me, it helps me to be around other people who are doing what I'm doing, who are funny people. Um, that's what helps me did that, get inspired. So now that you mentioned it, did, did you find that intimidating in, the, in your beginning of your career, like pitching, trying to be funny around funny people? Like, how, how did that in work? In a writer's you? room? Yeah. Absolutely. Well, one of the things I always say to writers coming in is listen more than you talk. You <sighs> don't want to come in and be the stand up comedian who's like, I listen and learn and when you've got something really good to say say it mm -hmm. but it's it's kind of like a blind date you're in a room with some someone in this case several people you don't know and you're feeling it out you're feeling out what the showrunner likes you're feeling mm -hmm. out what the co-eps the upper level writers what they respond to you're seeing the ones who need to suck up the oxygen and talk a lot mm -hmm. you're seeing who not to you you get used to it you sort of figure it out you feel out the vibe of a room and a but lot of times sorry i was gonna say showrunner will take you aside and go hey you're pitching too much or you're pitching right. too little if you have a good showrunner or you have good upper level writers they will hopefully take you under their wing and give you a little guidance here. but certainly now like you could join any writing staff or you've been doing it long enough you could sit down in any writer's room today day one and contribute in a meaningful way and not feel intimidating, intimidated. Like you'd open your mouth and pitch. And and if it bombed, you'd be fine with it. You'd come up with something else oh, five minutes if later. it bombed, if it, yes, I'd be fine with it. But yes, yeah, sure, it's intimidating. It is intimidating because there are writers that I look up to uh -huh. and shows that I am wildly, yes, I think for me, and I've said this before, it's, it's safety in a room. If you have a showrunner that where you feel safe, Mm -hmm. to pitch bad stuff because a lot of times something good will come out of something bad right a safe environment but when you're new somewhere it doesn't feel safe right away you don't know these people you don't know you know but if you're in a safe environment be it on the best show in the world the worst show in the world you're going to do your best it's when you are clenched and but do you still panicked. feel that way now you've been doing it all these years you could jump into a show you i don't think you'd be intimidated on on day one to open your mouth. I don't, I don't think know. not to open my mouth, but but again, it depends. Is it a new show and I'm coming in at the beginning and helping mm -hmm. create and helping, or is it a show that's been on for three seasons and everybody already knows each other? I mean, it's like going to a right. new high school when everyone's been in school since kindergarten. It, it takes you a minute to just know where do I fit in and how is this room? Every room's different. Every yeah. room is run differently. I remember in the Frasier room, people were supposed to be silent and then 
only pitch when they had something brilliant to say. And then yeah. there are other rooms that are complete free for alls. So it depends on the room and it depends on who you're surrounded by. I take on a lot of, you know, the vibe of the room. It's so, so funny you say that because we did a show, we did out of practice, which was Chris Lloyd and Joe Keenan, you yes. know, two, of the, two of the big, the heavy hitters in Frazier. Yes, I had a meeting with them that I will tell you about. Oh, oh, let's hear that. Because the reputation, they I, they were aware of that reputation and they didn't, I don't think they wanted that reputation anymore. Like the, I heard on Frazier Writers Room, they only ate on China. Like, yeah. <laughs> like, I don't think it was true, but that's what you heard. And so they, they didn't want that on, on out of practice and they hired a fun staff and it was really loose. It was pretty funny uh, to see these, you know, to see, you know, Joe Keenan loosen up and Chris Lloyd. It was like, I worked with fun. Joe Keenan. Joe Keenan was delightful and silly and ridiculous and I had a fine time. But when I met with Chris Lloyd, I found him enormously intimidating. Because he he's, just was he's one of the best writers in Hollywood. <laughs> That's and he was very serious. He was very handsome. Yeah. And the show was called Bram and Alice. Do you remember right. the show? It was like Alfred Molina playing a right. kind of an in intellectual. And for some reason, I put on a string of pearls because I thought, oh, it's a show about intellectuals. I should yeah. wear a string of pearls for some reason to impress this. And um, yeah, so I mean... Yes, I would get. I still get intimidated. Sure, sure, I do. Is that your? But is that your story? You're gonna you're gonna tell about Chris like that your Bram and Alice story? Is that it? Well, the Bram and Alice story was basically that um, I kept being told you're in the mix. I was like, did I did I get the job? Did I not get the job? You're in the mix, which is something right. people will say to you, meaning you're, they're still considering you. And my agent just said it for so long. He just kept saying it to the point that the show got shot and made. And I was like, it, the joke was just, I'm still in the mix in the on mix. Bram and Alice. <laughs> and he just kept telling me I'm on the mix that I clearly was not in. Not in the for mix. For some reason, it just went on forever. So I'm still in the mix today for that show. Yeah, yeah, well, phone's gonna ring. Um, but um, yes, I still get intimidated, of course, sure. Interesting. Interesting. Okay. It goes away. It waxes and wanes, but it's anytime you're in a group of new people, you don't know, you know, you don't well, know. Because so you, because you have all these credits, you can say, you know, the joke is, you know, you're in a room, well, you know, on Suburgatory or, you know, when, when we, when we did uh, Community. That was a place I was very intimidated on, on both Community and Suburgatory. That doesn't mean I didn't do good work on the show. And that doesn't uh -huh. mean that I didn't sit down and write a really good draft or, or contribute something great. Mm -hmm. But again, it's like a blind date. You know, you're gonna vibe with some people and not with others. Their way of working is gonna be different. Will they get the best out of you? Will it, they make you clam up? You just don't know. And on both those shows, I was working with really strong showrunners uh -huh. who were very talented and very funny. And I was in awe of both of them. And for me, it made me a little quieter, a little more reserved. I'm a very, lively, right. filthy, right. silly person. And I shut that off a little bit. Who was Suburgatory? Who was running that? Suburgatory was Emily Kapnick, who I love. Oh, She's sure. just a force of nature, just fantastic, great yes. writer. Um, and I'd never really experienced anything quite like her. She And the way that she approached her shows and her comedy. Mm -hmm. And so I just, you know, get quiet and I listen and I absorb it. Um, but yeah, you get intimidated sometimes. It makes you quiet sometimes. Depends. It, just depends. What are your final thoughts on this whole writer strike thing? Potential, um, potential writer strike. Right I now, think that strike. it is it is uh, the right thing to do. I yeah. think in Hollywood there is more than enough money um, and resources for everybody, and mm -hmm. sometimes people tend to want to hoard that money and those yeah. resources. And um, writers of a certain level, like a mid-level, you're not a Shonda Rhimes, but you're not just starting out, can't make a living mm -hmm. in the the current uh, yeah. way that things are set up. So some changes need to be made. They are long overdue. Mm -hmm. And with streaming, everything has changed. Yeah. And it's time to, you know, you got to stand up and fight for what's right. So that's what we're doing. She's right. For the and younger writers coming mm -hmm. up, too. Oh, you're going to give oh, yeah. me a big send off? I was going to give you send off. Let's see if you have something else to say. I Nothing? always have something else now to I... say. No, I'm done. I'm finished. <laughs> That's it. You silenced me. No, I don't want to silence you. I want to encourage you to. <laughs> no, not at all. Come out done. of your shell and say whatever you want I'm to say. Done. I don't I'm want done. to. I have taken a lot of your time. Emily, thank you're you so much. Uh, it's my pleasure. My absolute just... pleasure.
should should we should we plug anything? Should we have people follow you somewhere? Is there some place do you want to that have people to know what you're up to? I'm on Twitter. I What's think your I'm the, the real Emily Cutler. I think on Twitter. I don't even remember my own name. Yeah. Do you think there's uh, other people trying to be you that you have to? Um, no, but there were so many Emily Cutlers. I couldn't. I wanted to be the extra special Emily Cutler, yeah. so I said the real Emily Cutler. Um, I'm still on AOL, so I, I, I know I don't. That. I don't know what's cool. Yes, yeah, still I'll, on AOL. I yeah, noticed that when I got your email. This really is, sad. It's you... really sad. <laughs> really dating myself but yeah still on aol guys so. all right well thank you emily so My much pleasure. for being on our show uh you're always thank a delight you for having me and uh i'll sign off and then we'll we'll, we'll chat a little more Every, chat. So we'll chat. gossip okay thank you so much uh so everyone yeah uh we got more great guests coming up thank you for listening go to my website sign up we got a newsletter and all that stuff michaeljammon.com i'll see you next week thank you again everyone this has been an episode of screenwriters need to hear this with michael jammon and phil hudson if you're interested in learning more about writing make sure you register for michael's monthly webinar at michaeljammon.com slash webinar if you found this podcast helpful, consider sharing it with a friend and leaving us a five-star review on iTunes. For free screenwriting tips, follow Michael Jammon on social media at Michael Jammon Writer. You can follow Phil Hudson on social media at Phil A. Hudson. This podcast was produced by Phil Hudson. It was edited by Dallas Crane. Music by Ken Joseph. Until next time, keep writing. <laughs>